Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati and Jetta's grove, Anathan Pandika's park. There he addressed the monks thus. Monks, venerable sir, they replied, the venerable one said this. Monk Sariputta is wise. Sariputta has great wisdom. Sariputta has wide wisdom. Sariputta has joyous wisdom. Sariputta has quick wisdom. Sariputta has keen wisdom. Sariputta has penetrative wisdom. During half a month, monks, Sariputta gained insight into states one by one as they occurred. Now Sariputta's insights into state one by one as they occurred was this. Here, monks, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. Sariputta entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. And the states in the first jhana, the thinking, the examining thought, the joy, the happiness, the unification of mind, uh, <clears throat> in, in Buddhism, we have a thing called the five aggregates. The five aggregates and the four foundations of mindfulness are just ways of describing the same thing. So when you hear the five aggregates, it's actually saying the four foundations of mindfulness. And this is while you're in the jhana. The Satipatthana Sutta is claimed by people practicing straight vipassana as their sutta. Almost every time you hear a talk on the Satipatthana Sutta, it's a talk about it but they never actually tell you what it is that you're doing. You have a body, you have feeling. Feeling is pleasant, painful, neither pleasant nor painful. That in itself for most meditation teachers means emotional feeling and it's not that. It's just feeling. Either pleasant or painful, neither painful nor pleasant. It doesn't matter whether it's mental pain or physical pain. Treated in the same way. Pain and perception or Feeling and perception are conjoined. They always come together. As soon as a pleasant feeling arises, perception says that's a pleasant feeling. It puts a name on it. If it's a painful feeling, then perception says that's painful. If it's neither perception nor non-perception, then it says this is neutral. It's not pain, it's not pleasure. <clears throat> Perception is the part of your mind that names things. This is a book. The reason it's a book is because of memory. You've seen this before, you know what it is from your memory. So perception has memory in it, but it also names it. And where is a book? Is it this page? Is it the cover? 
where is a book? A book is a concept. And we think only in concepts. Nibbana is a state of no concepts. We'll get into that more later. <clears throat> okay. Now this, because this goes through the material jhanas and the immaterial jhanas, it doesn't say body, it says contact. If you didn't have a body, you wouldn't have contact. So it's basically saying the same thing. The contact, feeling, perception, formations in mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. So this is talking about the impermanence of everything. He understood thus, so indeed these states not having been come into being, having been they vanished. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted. He didn't try to hold on to anything. Unrepelled, he didn't try to push anything away. Independent, ta detached, free, dissociated with the mind rid of barriers. All of these are describing what is probably the most important aspect of the Buddha's teaching, and that is the impersonal nature of everything. And I say impersonal, not not self. Self didn't really come into being, the concept of self didn't really come into being until Freud. And when they started translating some of his works, there, uh, the German word they used was Geist, which means soul. And the reason they use that word is because they don't have a word in German for mind. Isn't that odd? So they use the word Geist, which means soul to them. So we need to understand very clearly what this actually does mean. And it does mean it's impersonal. And why do I use that term? Because when craving arises, you have the I like it, I don't like it mind. That's the thing that starts off the personal nature, the false idea in a personal self. So when I say impersonal, it takes that out. He understood there's an escape beyond this, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. So you know, when, once you start getting on this path, your understanding at every level changes. And your meditation will change. You're not always going to be staying with your spiritual friend that will change as you go deeper. Again, monks, with the stilling of thinking and examining thought, Sariputta entered and abided in the second jhana. 
which has self-confidence and stillness of mind without thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of collectedness. Now, there's five different kinds of joy. Three kinds of joy only occur when the conditions are right in your daily life. These kind occur at any time. The last two kinds of joy only occur when uh, there's mental development. Now the kind of joy he's talking about here is called uplifted joy. You feel very light in your mind, light in your body. Sometimes you get so light in your body you can actually float for a little bit. Uh, that has happened with some of my students, not very many. So don't look for it to happen to you necessarily. But if it does, it's okay. Doesn't matter. The happiness occurs when the joy fades away. Then your mind becomes very tranquil. And you feel very comfortable in both your mind and your body, very peaceful and calm. That's what the Buddha called happiness. And the unification of mind, the coming together and just staying on your object of meditation without any problem. When you get to the second jhana, that's when I will tell you not to verbalize a wish anymore. Now you just bring up the feeling of the wish without words in your mind. This is called the noble place of noble silence. Okay? And the states in the second jhana, the self-confidence, you become very confident that now you're starting to really understand how to do it. And that self-confidence gives you a satisfaction that you're progressing with your meditation. Every level you progress more and more deeply and there are signposts, and that's what we call jhana. <clears throat> and the states in the second jhana, the self-confidence, the joy, the happiness, the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, formation, and mind. That's the four foundations of mindfulness again. The enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood there's still more to do, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. So you know you're on the path, but you're, you're just starting out. Again, with the fading away of joy, Sariputta abided in equanimity, mindful and fully aware still feeling happiness with the body. He entered upon and abided in the third jhana on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. When you get to the third jhana, you no longer have joy arise in your mind. And you start to feel 
very nice balance in your mind. You'll hear a sound, but it won't shake your mind. It won't make your mind run to it. You'll just know that it was there. Somebody riding a motorcycle or a truck going along one of our roads, you'll hear it. But that's all. There's no reaction to it. Now, what happens in this jhana is you feel very comfortable in your mind and your body. And you become so comfortable that you won't feel different parts of your body. You won't feel your hands or a leg or a shoulder. If you put your attention on it, yes, you'll feel it. But if you keep your attention on your object of meditation, it will just fade away. Eventually, the feeling of loving kindness in your heart goes out of your body, up into your head. Don't push it back down. Let it stay up in your head. And that's a very good sign. That's one of the things that I look for. When that happens, then I'm going to give you a change in your meditation. And the states in the third jhana, the equanimity, the pleasure, the mindfulness, the full awareness, and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, formation, and mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred, known to him. Those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood there's still more to do, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Now, what happens when you get up into, into the feeling in your head is you have gotten to the fourth jhana. In the fourth jhana is where you become an advanced meditator. And the Buddha praised the fourth jhana on a lot of different levels. But you've given up your emotional states of joy and happiness. And now you just have very strong balance of mind. You still stay with your object of meditation, but the object of meditation will be changed. Again, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. <clears throat> so that balanced feeling that you had in the third jhana gets even stronger. By this time, you should be able to stay with your object of meditation for, oh, eight or ten minutes, maybe fifteen minutes, something like that, without your mind getting distracted. And the states in the fourth jhana, the equanimity, the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, the mental unconcern due to tranquility, the purity of mindfulness and unification of mind, the contact feeling, perception, formations, and mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, 
these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred known to him those states arose known they were present known they disappeared he understood there is still more to do and with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is <clears throat> again monks with the complete surmounting of gross perceptions of form when you start losing feeling in your body the only time you will feel your body is if you put your attention on it intentionally or an insect lands on you you will feel it but your mind doesn't shake it just knows that it's there With the disappearance of gross perceptions of sensory impact. Aware that space is infinite. Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite space. This is where the feeling of loving kindness changes to a feeling of compassion. Also, you will feel an expansion happening in your mind, just a going out in all directions at the same time. And this is when you're going to be radiating loving kindness to all beings in all the different directions. But now you take compassion as your object of meditation, not loving kindness you'll be able to tell the difference between the two. I'm not going to explain it to you. You have to explain it to me. And the states in the base of infinite space with compassion. One of the things that Mahayana has done is they talk a lot about compassion and infinite compassion. That's a slight misunderstanding of this state. It's compassion with infinite space. Now the Buddha sat in this state every day for a couple of hours, radiating loving kind or radiating compassion to all beings in all the directions. Nice way to start the day. And the states in the base of infinite space with compassion. The perception of the base of infinite space with compassion and unification of mind. The contact feeling perception formations and mind. So we are now in what is called an arupa jhana. And you'll get to experience it on this retreat. I have a lot of confidence in you. <clears throat> you still have the four foundations of mindfulness even in the Arupa Jhanas. Not all of the Arupa Jhanas, but I'll explain that as we go. The enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. And he understood there's still more to do with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is so you know that you're pretty solid on the path but there's still more coming 
Again, monks, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space with compassion, aware that consciousness is infinite and the feeling of compassion changes to a very gentle, not excited state of uh, joy. Now what happens is the feeling of compassion disappears and the feeling of joy arises. What you're going to see is individual consciousnesses arise and pass away, arise and pass away. It happens very quickly. It'll happen at one or more of the sense doors. But it's a kind of blinking, like a movie is going too slowly and you see a picture and there's a blank spot and a picture and a blank spot. That's what it's like, but it happens fairly fast. Now, that was about a hundred thousand arising and passing away of individual consciousnesses. And now you're going to be seeing individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. This particular state of the base of infinite space is very important to realize that when you see this, you're seeing change happening very, very quickly. This is one of the things that uh, your friend from Korea, Stephen Batchelor, does not understand. He still thinks that it's a continuous consciousness. Anyway, not only are you seeing that, you're seeing the unsatisfactory nature of change. You want to be able to get into a space that's just peaceful and calm, where there's not much of that sort of thing happening. And you're seeing very clearly the impersonal nature of everything. You're not in control. There's no you there. And this is where you can have some deep insights into this is happening by itself. I, my mind doesn't have anything to do with it. It's just observing. So you get some, a lot of insights in this particular state. And the states in the base of infinite consciousness, the perception of the base of infinite consciousness with joy. Now joy is your object of meditation. Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite consciousness with joy. The contact, feeling, perception, formations, and mind, still with the four foundations of mindfulness. The contact feeling, I said that already, the enthusiasm, decision, mindful, or energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him, those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. So you see that you really begin to realize that this is true at this state. He understood there's still more to do and with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is. Again, 
by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness and joy, aware that there is nothing. Sariputta enters upon and abided in the base of nothingness with equanimity. Now your mind, the joy fades away and you have very strong balance in your mind. Mind is not looking outside of itself anymore like it does with infinite consciousness. Now you're just seeing by staying with the equanimity, you're seeing nothing much. And this is where you have to start adjusting little tiny bits. If your attention is too strong on the feeling of equanimity, your mind will get restless. Not quite strong enough, your mind will get dull. So you have to learn how to adjust. It's like walking on a tightrope, very fine tightrope. And the states in the base of nothingness with equanimity. Now this is as high as the Brahma Viharas will take you. When you get into the next stage, you're starting to talk about very, very subtle states, more subtle than even seeing an individual consciousness. <clears throat> but with this, you still have contact, feeling, perception, formations in mind. The contact, feeling, formation, perceptions, and mind, the f enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states are defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him, those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood there's still more to do, even though you're sitting in nothing. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Now, what happens next? The feeling of equanimity will disappear. You'll get into a state that is very much like being asleep and being aware at the same time mind becomes very, very subtle at this state. And that feeling will start to fade away, but you still, your mind will get into such strong silence that you'll be able to sit for a fairly long period of time without anything arising. This is where you take mind as your object of meditation. And your job is only to observe. That's what mindfulness is all about. Observe how there's any slight movement or vibration that arises in mind. <coughs> So when you see any kind of movement or vibration, right then, you use the six R's. Okay? That movement or vibration will not necessarily just disappear. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes a thought will come up, but you're not keeping your attention on that. And You've already six hearted. So you just keep watching mind, not the content of the thought. This is a dangerous place.
for a lot of meditators because they want to follow the thought. And that will slow down your progress a lot. I had one student that did that for seven years before I finally got him to stop doing it. He was able to sit in neither perception or non-perception for a long period of time, but he kept on following, oh, I had a memory of a past lifetime. And the reason that he got into that was because he had so much psychotherapy. And they, they say, follow it. And then he did straight Vipassana. And Vipassana says, watch it until it goes away, which is not right effort, by the way. So you don't keep your attention on it, you just watch mind. And when you get distracted by a little movement or vibration, relax. You'll be able to sit for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour without having any movement of mind's attention. And mind will come up and try to trick you in whatever way it can to get some excitement going and throw up a, a memory or whatever so that you can get involved with it because it doesn't like the idea of just observing. And when boredom arises, I, I, uh, when I'm in Indonesia, I make that a forbidden word because when somebody complains to me about boredom, who's bored? Who doesn't like it? Who wants it to have some kind of movement? Who has lost their mindfulness? So I don't let them use that word. Now they say the B word, it's the same thing. They have to understand that their mind is attached still to, I'm still here and I'm gonna cause a disturbance. And they, they forget to use the six R's. So, it's very important. This is where you're going to start sitting long, and I'm going to encourage you to sit long. Three hours, four hours, five hours, like that. Before you get out of that meditation, and this only takes a couple of minutes, it's very quick and easy. Reflect on what happened while you were in that state. Because sometimes there's perception of it and sometimes there's not, but there's still something that arises. So when it comes up into your memory, then six R right then. Then get up and start walking. Now, what I suggest very strongly is you walk with a lot of energy. Walk very quickly. Walk fast enough that you're breathing through your mouth. And we have some steps on the backside of the dining hall going up to the library. Go up and down the steps fast. Get your blood moving because it settles into your legs and you've got to get your circulation going again. You've got to get your heart beating very quickly. It's very necessary. 
Now uh, here you're not going to be noticing the four foundations of mindfulness so much. You still are going to be able to observe when there's a little movement of mind's attention. But mind is so subtle at this point. The four foundations of mindfulness are too gross a feeling. Now, it's a very important thing for you to realize that when you sit long and then you get up and walk and then you come back and you sit, start sitting long again, the first part of your sitting can be very active. Your mind can have a lot of thoughts coming through a lot of distractions and what your mind is doing is actually helping you to develop your mindfulness to a finer degree so you have to 6R a lot and after 45 minutes or an hour all of a sudden it just stops now you're just taking mind as your object to meditation and there's no disturbance or only an occasional disturbance. <clears throat> Eventually you will get to a place where all perception, feeling, and consciousness stops. This is called the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. You won't know you're in that state until you come out of that state. When you come out of that state, you will feel a very big sense of relief, like you've let go of a heavy burden. You can see very quickly little tiny movements. It happens very fast of mind's attention. Not big, but very, very small, very slight. Some people notice it, some people don't. It's still there. And then you will feel exceptional joy. And that joy will stay with you for quite a while. You have become a sotapanna. That's the first stage of awakening. The Buddha described somebody that they also call it a stream enterer, entering the stream. The Buddha described this as now you have given up an ocean of suffering. You will not be born less than a human being. You'll only be reborn seven more times at the most before you become an arahad and get off the wheel. You will have a change of perspective. The way you see things is going to change a little bit. You're going to be able to observe things more keenly without distraction in your mind. Um, colors become a little bit brighter. Um, seeing individual things that used to be clusters, you'll see those individual things like the petals on a flower or something like that, you'll see it much more clearly. You won't intentionally break a precept. So you're purifying your mind. And actually, this is what a Buddhist calls being a saint. Uh, with the Catholic religion being so strong and talking about saints so much and what has to happen, they have to have so many miracles happen and that sort of thing. That's not for real.
the Buddha era that we're in right now is called the Age of Saints. And it's going to last for about 5,000 years. Now, an interesting thing with this first stage of awakening, depending on your understanding, if you listen to a Dhamma talk very attentively and understand the Dhamma talk, you can have this occur. You can have this happen for yourself. Doesn't happen very often because the understanding does have to be very deep. But to go all the way through to arahatship, you have to sit in meditation. I have quite a few students that have experienced this. And there is a change in personality. It's not a big one. You still get excited like you used to. You still have emotional upsets like you used to. But you don't get caught in them for as long. And they disappear very quickly. Because you see that you're taking it personally. <coughs> you're never again going to have any doubt as to whether this is the right path or not. No more doubt is ever going to arise in your mind. You know this is it. You're going to let go in the belief of rites and rituals. Now, I have some students that have gotten up to the third stage of awakening. It's called an anagami. And they've been doing a lot of, uh, they like the Mahayana chanting and they still do it. But they know that it does not lead to Nibbana. But they like doing it. So they, they said, can I still chant? I said, I honestly, I don't care. That's up to you. While you're on retreat, I don't want you to chant because that's a distraction away from the meditation. When you get off retreat and you want to chant, do it as long as you want. It's up to you. And you're going to see very clearly that everything is impersonal you're still going to have the old habit of getting caught in it. But, not as strong. And when you sit back and realize that you're causing yourself the suffering and see that, know that it's impersonal, then you can let go of it much more quickly, more easily. So there's a major change that happens in your personality when you get to the first stage of awakening. And you come and you, we discuss, and there's other questions that I'll ask about it just to make sure. And I will tell you to test it on your own. Make sure that it's real. Some people, they hear about it, they make up what they think is right, and they overestimate what their practice really was. And I have one student that she only became a Sotapanna. And because of some of the experiences she had in meditation, she says that she's an Arahat. That's overestimation. Some people are like that. <clears throat> now, what I'm going to tell you to do is good. Then I'm going to tell you to go back to the equanimity. And uh, you'll learn how to do that on the way. 
and stay with the equanimity till it disappears again and then take mind as your object of meditation. And you're still going to have the first bit be active and that's okay, you six R. Then it stops and you just stay with that peaceful, calm mind. You'll be able to stay even a little bit longer with that peaceful, calm mind. Sometimes an hour, hour and a half with nothing happening at all. Don't break your sitting. Keep sitting. Eventually you'll get to a place where the cessation of perception, feeling and consciousness occurs again. It occurs because all of your awakening factors get in perfect balance. When it happens again, you have become a sotapanna with fruition. And what that basically means is that state of mind is pretty much cemented. Now, if you're a sotapanna without fruition, you still will have the temptation to say things that aren't true. Your mind will start rejecting it, but you can overpower that and still do that. You're going to lose your attainment if you do that. When you have the fruition, your mind will be a lot stronger and your mind will just say, no. And you keep your precepts very well from, for the rest of your life. Then we will discuss that. And I will tell you, good, go back and do the equanimity until it fades away. Go back and take mind as your object of meditation. When the conditions are right, that all of the, the awakening factors are in balance, then you can attain the next step. That's called Sakadagami. A Sakadagami is called a once returner. And that means you'll only be reborn as a human being one more time. From there, you only will be reborn in one of the Brahma Lokas. Then you will attain Arahatship there and get off the wheel. So you'll never come back as a human being again. Becoming a Sakadagami means that you lessen the lust and hatred that arises in your mind. It still can arise, but it's not near as strong. You catch it more quickly and let go more easily. So I'm going to tell you to go back to the equanimity and then get into watching mind again. And that experience can happen again. This time, <coughs> this is the fruition of Sakadagami, the once, once returner. And a lot of people uh, kind of misunderstand. They think that they're never supposed to have any lust or hatred arise in their mind again, but that doesn't happen until you get to the next step. But your awareness becomes much better and you have more equanimity in your mind with everything. Then you continue on and you experience the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness again. 
and you become an anagami, which means a non-returner. You're never going to be reborn in the human state again. You will have no lust or hatred arise in your mind again. You won't have any fear, you won't have any anxiety, you won't have any uh, aversion. your mindfulness is going to be very, very sharp. And what you're going to have in your mind most of the time <coughs> is loving kindness, equanimity, and your mind is going to be very collected. You're not going to have a real active mind anymore. But it'll still be there. There is some still, some slight attachment. You start thinking that, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. I. Mm, it's still there. And then I'm going to tell you to do more of the same. Go back to the equanimity, watch mind, until the fruition comes. And that cements it. If you're married, um, you're going to be living with your spouse like brother and sister. And there won't ever be any lust, even for food, arising. You still will have some preferences on food, depending on, because I travel so much, I have so many different kinds of food thrown at me, that I still have preferences of the kind of taste that, that I want, and that's, that's okay not a big deal because I, I can eat anything even bitter gourd I can eat it but it just because I didn't grow up with it I don't particularly like the taste of bitter I, I grew up with Missouri kind of food Anyway, think of the relief of never have any fear or anxiety arise in your mind again. Ah, what relief is that? Now, when you die from this state, you will be reborn in a special Brahma Loka. And this is where the misunderstanding of Pure Land comes from. When you're reborn spontaneously in that realm, uh, you will eventually become an Arahat. And when you die from that realm, there is no more being, no more becoming, no more uh, person. Because when you become an arahat, you give up the final fetters. Even an anagami can have some restlessness or some dullness of mind when they become an arahat, it doesn't happen. They give up the idea of being reborn in a particular place. They give up that conceit and pride and they give up ignorance. 
so they never again have craving arise in their mind. No more craving. Nice. Only seeing things very, very clearly. No restless thoughts coming in to distract them. All of you ask them a question, they point their mind in that direction, they can give you the answer. So they're into their intuition in a big way. And each of these different steps has two steps in it. You become, say, an arahat that's on the path, and then you keep going until you get to be an arahat with fruition. So it's a absolutely pure state of mind. Now I get asked a lot, how many arahats do you know? And I don't know any. I search for them. I've heard that there's a couple still alive and well in Thailand. I've heard that there's some in the forest in Burma that are arahats, genuine arahats, not just because somebody says they are doesn't mean anything. <clears throat> but there's not many of them around that I know of. There's a lot of claims, but I know what to look for in somebody that claims. And I, if I spend a few months with them, then I can determine for myself whether it's real or not. Anyway, that is the final goal. From there, there's the breakup of the aggregates, nothing holding them together anymore. <coughs> and that's what the Buddha called Paranibbana. And that's what happened with him. Okay, so we'll get back to uh, neither perception nor non-perception. Again, monks, by completely surmounting the base of equanimity and nothingness, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And he emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he observed the states that had passed, ceased, and changed. That's why I'm telling you, you need to reflect every time you get done with the sitting. It, don't, it doesn't take long. But there were some things that you didn't necessarily notice before that did happen, and they need to be six art. So your mind can be absolutely pure. So indeed, these states not having been, come into being, having been, they vanish. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. He understood there's an escape beyond this, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Again, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. And his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. In other words, he's going to see and understand 
perfectly how the links of dependent origination work. No more question. He emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he recalled the states that had passed, ceased, and changed. Having been, they vanish. <clears throat> Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, un unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. He understood there is no escape beyond this. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is not. Monks, rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, he has attained mastery and perfection in noble virtue attain mastery and perfection in noble collectedness, attain mastery and perfection in noble wisdom, attain mastery and perfection in noble deliverance. It is of Sariputta indeed that rightly speaking this should be said. Monks, rightly speaking, were to be said of anyone he is the son of the Blessed One, born of his breast, born of his mouth, born of the Dhamma, created by the Dhamma, an heir in the Dhamma, not an heir in material things. It is of Sariputta indeed that rightly speaking this should be said. Monks, the matchless wheel of Dhamma set rolling by the Tathagata is kept rolling rightly by Sariputta. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now Sariputta was the first chief disciple. And Moggallana was the second chief disciple. <clears throat> and they co-taught a lot. Sariputta would take someone who has no attainment at all and he would get them to Sotapanna. Then he would hand them over to Moggallana. Moggallana took them to Arahatship. So they were a real good combination. Interesting thing is, both Moggallana and Sariputta were about 10 years older than the Buddha. And they both died before the Buddha uh, died. And Sariputta was about 90 years old. That was the same year that the Buddha died. And he decided that he wanted to go home and he saw his, his mother was still alive. She was 120 years old. And she had been practicing praying to one of the deities, whatever it happened to be. And when he went home, just before he died, there was a lot of deities that appeared and paid respect to Sariputta for his greatness and help that he, he gave. <clears throat> and his mother, who was very attached to praying to this one deity, saw that the deity was paying respect to Sariputta. And because of that, she gave up her attachment to that deity and she became a Sotapanna. So that's kind of an interesting little story. Anyway, everybody that is serious enough to come here and really practice has the opportunity 
to get to these states that I've been talking about. You're going to get there at your own speed. But the closer you follow the directions, the more you smile, the more you have fun, the more you laugh with how crazy your mind can be, the faster your progress becomes. I have many, many students that have done other meditations and they kind of want to put some of, oh, I learned this in this meditation, I want to use it here. Doesn't work. So you need to follow the recipe as closely as you can. Keep your mind light. <clears throat> Sit as long as you're comfortable. No less than 30 minutes, but when you're sitting is good, stay with your sitting as long as you can. Don't break a sitting because of a meal. Okay? We'll make sure you got enough food. You don't have to worry about that. If you're sitting and the lunch bell rings and your sitting is good, continue sitting. We will put out a dish of food for you so whenever you're done with that sitting, you can come and eat. That's why it says in the precepts, uh, after the noonday meal. So your noonday meal can be one o'clock or two o'clock. And it's still not breaking the precept. I want to talk a little bit about food because I want you to understand that there is a difference between hard food and soft food. And you need to have a balance. Soft food is uh, fruits, uh, white rice is a soft food, but sticky rice is a hard food. Although we don't have sticky rice here very often, I don't think she knows how to make it. But putting some nuts in with your food, um, it'll stay in your stomach for longer when you have hard food like that. And you don't get hungry. Now, she has diabetes, so I allow her the space to take the medicine. And that is, she gets some food after the Dhamma talk or right before, however you do it, I don't care. <clears throat> you can take honey anytime you want, and that helps coat your stomach so that you don't have so much hunger arise. And you can take uh, yogurt. Yogurt with honey in it is very nice. <laughs> That's one of the, uh, the things in Sri Lanka they do. It's not honey that they put in it, it's uh, uh, sugar cane syrup. Anytime you get something that's too hot, there's different ways of handling it. Sometimes food can be very spicy. You take some sugar and you put it on the spoon, on, on the food. That will take the heat away. Or just lessen it because the chemical reaction with the spice makes it tamer. But in Sri Lanka, they use uh, yogurt. And uh, the first time I went to Sri Lanka, I was staying at a monastery that was very far away so that there was always uh, spicy food. 
I mean, it was really hot. And even some of their desserts had chili peppers in it. So I had to learn how to temper that. <laughs> and work, yogurt works kind of, but not as good as, as and I'm, I'm not talking about huge amounts of sugar, I'm just talk, talking about sprinkling it on. And that changes the chemical composition of the heat, so it's not so bad. But don't fill up on soft food that doesn't stay in your stomach. You need to have that balance. And as you get more used to it, that you'll just start doing it naturally. And one of the reasons that we put cottage cheese out every day is because that stays in your stomach very nicely. Okay, do you have any questions? It's a curse. Nobody has any questions when I get done with the Dhamma talk. Did you understand everything that I was saying? Then ask a question. Yeah. Well, if you don't understand something, even while I'm talking, raise your hand and I will try to answer your question. Don't be afraid of that. Okay? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.